Hello and welcome to Infinity. I'm Charlie Serafin. If you've been listening to our program since its beginnings, you've already heard about the Meru Project, a research project which indicates that scientific information about the nature of creation may be encoded in the first letters of the book of Genesis, the biblical story of creation. Our guests are John Keeler and Foster Gamble, representatives of the Meru Foundation, which supports this research. Gentlemen, if we can, let's summarize what the research is all about, in case someone doesn't know about the Meru Project. Well, Charlie, let me uh, summarize it actually by setting the scene for you a little bit. Um, and for, for the listeners, imagine if you were walking down the beach and all of a sudden you saw a bottle sitting in the sand and you went over to it and you noticed that there, were some, uh, there was a note inside. Uh, imagine how difficult it would be to just walk on down the beach and not open that. And uh, take, to take that one step further, imagine that you're on a spaceship hurtling through outer space and... Uh, it, and you've gotten word that there, there are difficulties on the spaceship. The nuclear waste from the engine seems to be polluting the air, and there's, there, there's dangers in that regard. Uh, the crew members are starting to, to uh, battle among themselves, and they, they've gotten a hold of nuclear weapons, and if any single one fires off those weapons, it looks like the whole spaceship may blow up. Then imagine that in one of your basic um, manuals, on, in, your, in your spaceship library, uh, someone came across what they thought to be a code that looked like it was from an ancient civilization and looked like it had to do with uh, fundamental principles of, of life process and, and that it might have something to do with, um, with survival itself. Uh, imagine how difficult it would be not to try to figure out what that's about. Um, one of our colleagues, Stan Tennant, back in 1968, um, just happened to see what he thought to be a pattern in the arrangement of the Hebrew letters, the Torah scroll letters uh, of the first chapter of the book of Genesis. And, of course, he put it aside thinking, well, uh, that's ridiculous. And he kept coming back to it. And to make a, a very long story very short, ten years later, um, ten years of research later, he found the cue to the first level of cracking the code, which was a, a base three mathematical system. And the The... I would really like to ask you to, to ask yourself and ask the listeners to ask themselves, uh, what would you do if you had been in that spaceship situation where you actually felt the, that the life of your culture, much, le much less yourself, was threatened? What would you do in terms of survival and in terms of maybe leaving a message for someone else? Actually, the United States faced, is, is obviously facing the same situation, and the, the NASA's Project SETI went, went about doing something about this, and they ended up sending out a, a message now known as the, the Arecibo message from the, the radio telescope in Arecibo, Puerto Rico, and also on the side of, of several pioneer spacecrafts, just sent it out into space. It's now left uh, our solar system, the first, um, the first man-made thing to what do is, that. What is SETI? It's the uh, something of extraterrestrial intelligence. The purpose was to, um, to try to contact someone out there if that were to occur, because it was clear that 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 message would outlast our, our planet Earth. And what they did, they had to face the challenge of how would you communicate with an extraterrestrial through time and space. And what they did was they created a base two mathematical code, which, um, which when deciphered, resolves into a, a two-dimensional TV picture and carries information about um, the, our numbers, one to ten, the atomic numbers for hydrogen, car carbon, nitrogen, etc., some chemical formulas about DNA, a scale drawing of a human being and our solar system and the, and the double helix. Um, and this is what they sent out into space. And in 1978, what, uh, what happened in our project was we tried, a, uh, for several rational mathematical reasons, we were led to try a base three mathematical code, assigning a base three uh, signature to each of the le 27 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and all of a sudden the code started to unravel. And the first level of pattern that we have gotten uh, does three things that have absolutely astounded us and nurtured us going on in the project. The first thing that it does is it, uh, the code, the pattern as arranged, uh, s satisfies the criterion for an error-correcting code. In other words, you can lose a letter and replace that letter just by the strength of the pattern alone. We found that to be rather surprising. Secondly, it, it is a mathematical model for what is called a torus. Uh, simply seen a torus as a bagel or a donut. It's an inner tube shape. Scientists are now saying that, that the basic unit of light energy, a photon, 
uh, is in a toroidal form. The largest um, physical entity that we can imagine, a black hole, is in a toroidal form. It's the, no, the, the shape of first cause, one might say, or the shape of the, the, of the pattern of creation. Thirdly, the, the pattern, as it's drawn, um, fits exactly over an aerial view of the Cheops Pyramid in the Giza Plateau in Egypt. And, and we've found in our research that, that there are many reasons why it looks like that's so. Could you explain that a little further? You say that it, the pattern that's formed based on a base three mathematical formula ascribing values to the letters in the, in the first sentences and paragraph in, in the book of Genesis in the Bible fits over a pyramid? Yes, the, the Great Pyramid in Egypt. And some people probably don't know that the Great Pyramid uh, is now predominantly thought to be not a tomb there's been no evidence that it was a burial chamber, but that it was, in fact, an initiation chamber. Many legends say that it, that it actually was where the Egyptian initiates went for the seventh stage of their spiritual initiation, um, in addition to, to that pyramid being a clock and a calendar and so forth. And the, our, our research um, has led us to believe that Abraham, Moses, Plato, Pythagoras, and some say Jesus himself were among the Egyptian initiates initiated in that pyramid. By initiation, uh, it l what, what we think that that means is actually the, the experience of uh, higher vibrational levels, higher states of consciousness that were assisted by, uh, the, by a, a reverberation, by a, um, by a vibrational capacity of the Great Pyramid as a device. But I don't want to get too technically into well, that. Well, you kind of lost me a little bit, on, in, again, in terms of this shape fitting over the pyramid. H how do you mean that? We're talking about a bagel kind of shape. John, maybe you can enlighten me a little bit. We're talking about a bagel-type shape, mm -hmm. uh, something round with a, with a hole in it. And we're talking about a pyramid structure, which, mm -hmm. to the best of my knowledge, has flat sides. That's a right. round shape doesn't particularly fit over something with flat sides or conform well, to it at least. I'm going to have to ask you and the listeners to do a little imagining for a moment. Okay. First of all, the Geops Pyramid, as you know, has a flat top to it. It's the only pyramid that doesn't have an apex. Um, we feel that it was never intended to have a flat top because if you were to imagine looking at the pyramid from above, mm -hmm. what you'd see is a square and then in the middle you'd see a very small square, which is the apex. All right. Well, in draw, when you draw a torus in two dimensions, it turns out to form a square, a seven-turn spiral, starting at the, at the top, the apex, in the center, and going outward. So you have to imagine that spiral going out in this square with eight positions per turn along this pattern. Now, it turns out that you can place the letters of the first sentence of Genesis, as they occur in the sentence, on the... Uh, starting at the apex and going out along the spiral. And all of a sudden, a very peculiar thing happens. The letters, which don't look to be related, they're very different, lie side by side as they extend outward from the apex, the center of this donut, turn out to be base pairs. They're matched, or they're the base pair opposites. There's no exception to this throughout that 28-letter um, pattern. And it turns out that for mathematicians to map mathematically a torus, it takes 28 letters, 28 points, no more, lo no less. And it turns out that there just happens to be 28 letters in the first sentence of Genesis. Since you first came to Infinity and presented this material to us about a year ago, what progress has been made? Well, that uh, we'll have to address in, in several points. Um, I'd like to back up just a moment, if I can, to talk a little bit more about the pyramid and about how I, be how I became involved in the project, and then we'll go on and, and tell you about the, pro the, the uh, recent uh, breakthroughs that we've had. Um, in 1974, I first went to Egypt, and I saw the Great Pyramid for the first time, and I was fascinated and did some reading. Um, and none of the uh, explanations that I read in any text satisfied myself as to where, where the pyramid came from and what it was about. In 1981, before I became involved in this project, I went back on an American Express tour vacation. 
and had an opportunity to spend some time alone in the king's chamber. And um, unfortunately, I fell asleep while I was there. Um, and I had a peculiar dream. Um, and in the dream, I met a man named Professor Merrick. That's spelled M-E-R-E-K. And I just made a note of that in my journal and came back and got about my work here. Well, eight months later, I met Stan Tennant, our colleague, and he was talking to me about his idea concerning the pyramid and, of course, the text of Genesis. And we've named the project the Meru Project, M-E-R-U. It turns out that the ancient name of the Great Pyramid is Mera, M-E-R-E. And I thought it was off, a, 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 an amazing coincidence that I uh, had that particular dream while I was in one of the uh, oldest buildings on the planet. So naturally I became intrigued and I'm now uh, associated with the project. And I'll let Foster address your question about where we've come so far. Well, it's actually very exciting for me to do that right now because I'm still sort of floating on air because we have made the second major breakthrough uh, um, that we've been waiting for for a long time in this project. The first one was to try the base three code. Um, the, the key to the Arrocebo message which was base two and it, and it gave us a two-dimensional TV picture. The key to this was base three and it gave us a three-dimensional picture which is now um, which is now giving us the other information. The, the next step we have felt for some time in cracking this code would be to be able to to identify each of the Hebrew letters as the three-dimensional shape which we have felt them to be. And, uh, and just recently in the lab we have finally done that for all 27 letters. And um, much of this project obviously is highly speculative in a, on a very large scale. And to all of a sudden have um, the, the roots of each one of those speculations that tie into this particular alphabet all of a sudden um, lay out very clearly and connectedly in the way that we had anticipated that they would um, for all 27 letters has been stunning and what they do um, is delineate the shape of the torus. On a less, tech well, on a less uh, specific side we have made contact with mathematicians uh, and physicists and research scientists in, in several different fields um, who have been interested to hear the information, uh, usually very skeptical at first, just exactly as I was, and now there is a core of top-level mathematicians and physicists in, in particular who are very committed to this work and, and really see what it, it's about. So um, with, with the analogy that I was using before about the spaceship image, what we're doing is compiling a team of people with the necessary uh, connection and, and emotional connection and the necessary skill to find out what in the world this thing is really ab about. And, and the other aspect of it is that, that I personally have been doing a, a research aspect of this with, uh, with top psychics and asking them obviously not a, in a technical way, but asking them what is this project about and asking them basically all the same questions. And I've been absolutely stunned to see that essentially they're all telling us the same story and they're all validating the, the speculations that we have been making about What is about the story? The what is the speculation that they're... What they have been telling us is that there was in fact a code. Uh, there is a consciously created code in Genesis that it was a code of technical and metaphysical uh, awareness from Lemuria that was passed on to Atlantis. The people in Atlantis who, who supposedly saw the downfall coming, the, the burning up of their spaceship, uh, spread the knowledge and encoded it and spread it to several different places in the world, uh, one of which was Egypt, and that, um, and that Moses wrote the, the Genesis after his initiation in the Great Pyramid, and it was both a metaphysical... Um, knowledge of how to enter the next dimension as well as as a, a technical awareness of the the creation uh, the creation form this toroidal form being the ongoing shape of creation that was encoded into the, into this message so all of a sudden it's it's not surprising to find a creation story right where it ought to be right in the creation story in the root document of western civilization if you were going to encode something uh, and you wanted it to last as long as possible, uh, a logical place to put it would be in the most substantial building 
on the face of the earth and, um, the most pro and one of the most prolific books. Those are just some of the highlights of what's been going on. Has there anything, has anything physically been found in the Great Pyramids that would substantiate that or, or just in the shape of it, it itself? No, it's, it's, nothing has been found. Um, in fact, that's one of the um, puzzling things is that no one has found anything at all, not even hieroglyphics on the wall in the Great Pyramid. Um, I'd like to back up just a moment, if I can, um, to amplify on what Foster was talking about, the letters. I want to make it very simple for the listeners to have an idea of what we're talking about here. Imagine you're looking at a photon of light, and if you close your eyes, what you'd see is a ball of light. Um, the Bible might relate to this as the burning bush. Um, it's a whirling, a whirlwind of light. Um, it turns out that the shape mathematicians uh, think of a photon of light is a torus. So what the first sentence of Genesis describes mathematically is the shape of a photon. But it also describes the shape of the pyramid, which is called a pyramid torus. And the reason that we are interested in the, in the pyramid torus is because as you move from the second to the third dimension, you move from flat land, which is a flat tabletop space, into a three-dimensional space, which we exist in. And by implication, it's possible to move into the fourth dimension. It's very possible that the pyramid was built specifically to assist people in moving from the third to the fourth dimension, thus gaining an overview, a superior view of reality, uh, and, th and then coming back and teaching the rest of us what they've learned. In the material that you sent us, Foster, it says that the, the source of the text of Genesis is unknown. There were no Dead Sea Scrolls. Where do you suppose, then, that it came from? You talked about the, the possibility of someone encoding a message and leaving it behind. Um, I certainly don't know, and my intuition plus my research so far tells me th that there was a culture with a level of awareness, at least a metaphysical level of awareness, um, that included the toroidal form as the shape of first cause, or the shape of the ongoing process of creation, and that, and that they were aware of the of the Taurus as being the, the gateway, as John was talking about, to possibly uh, another dimension. And my, my research into people who are doing technological um, studies right now of so-called out-of-body travel, voluntary control of higher altered states of consciousness, again and again, the gateway is actually the experience of going through this toroidal form. Um, in terms of actually whether or not the story about Moses um, being initiated in the pyramid and, and writing it or, or Pythagoras um, developing the, this, uh, the, the alphabet symbols that we're coming across right now. I, I'm not really all that interested, I think historians will be, in the, in the personalities, but more the level of consciousness that passed it on. And I continue to be startled by that apparent level of consciousness. Another profound link for me in my research has been that... Um, I personally teach the art of Aikido, and recently we had a, a ceremony where someone did a particular chant that had been passed down through generations in a particular Japanese, um, a, a sort of a religious philosophy school called Kotodama, which means the vibration of the universe. This chant was called the echo of the vibration of the universe, and what it was, as I did it, I realized it was the, the creation of the Taurus um, within and, uh, and around your own body. And I talked to someone after the, this particular get-together who told me he had just been studying with an, uh, uh, quite an old uh, Kotodama master in New Mexico who had told him, and now this has recently come out in a, in a new book on Kotodama, that their legend is that, that has been passed on for generations is that this knowledge was intentionally encoded 4,000 years ago in the Hebrew language and the and it was to and this was a metaphysical awareness that was intentionally to be sublimated while the linear rational left side competitive technological brain of mankind was developed and obviously we've done that to a tremendous degree and their legends 
look to be suitable now. They look to be appropriate now because they, they say then at the appropriate age when that has been developed to a critical stage, then the spiritual consciousness or whatever you want to call it will then be reawakened in order that the two go hand in hand. And that's what I'm most excited about in this project is I see metaphysics and physics uh, beginning to touch, to merge. The realization that there is no boundary between the two is beginning to happen. And I think that, that, um, that this, this code, the technology of this code, um, may lead us in assisting technology in, in, um, in helping us in personal transformation, in modern-day pyramids, not having to go through all of that, of that bulk, but to, but to literally use our technological awareness to assist us in being able to channel higher and higher frequencies of vibration and the other way around, that, they, that our, an expanded spiritual awareness will uh, assist us in handling safely the technology that has obviously gotten beyond our ability to, to control it wisely. One of the things that we've tried to explore in a, a number of programs here on Infinity is the, the quest for a universal sound or universal music or universal language. Are there some vibrations that exist that are totally natural and the and the 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 source of sound the source of music the the source of vibration does anything in your research suggest i think you alluded to a chant but it isn't directly tied into the into the meru project um yes one of our conjectures is that the letters of the hebrew alphabet are somehow carved from this photon torus shape that we've talked about Imagine looking at a bagel of light and seeing the bagel from 27 different perspectives around it and then taking a slice like a knife through each perspective and that gives you each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Well, another conjecture is that there is a sound associated with that bagel or torus and so that there are 27 different sounds corresponding to the 27 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. So what we've done is we've given a note to each of the letters of the alphabet. And we have a is that a random sampling? You just yes, uh, randomly we, ascribe? We don't know what the keynote is yet. We're doing some research, and I imagine next time we get together, we'll have an update on you for that. But now we've brought to the lab, for the listeners, a short tape that we can play. And what the listeners will be hearing is we've just arbitrarily assigned um, letters to the Hebrew alphabet. And they'll and be... We've assigned, we've assigned pitches to the letters in order, so that we've created a 12-tone octave uh, beginning with the beginning of the alphabet. And... And, and then translated that um, through the computer into the music of the pattern of Genesis. Right. So people will be listening to the text of Genesis musically. Now, some people can't uh, visualize patterns, but other people can hear them acoustically. So we'd like to play a few seconds of it, and, and uh, the readers can decide for themselves. I mean, the listeners can decide for themselves. <laughs> Well, I don't know what listeners could uh, find in the pattern. To, to me, it it might almost sound like somebody with a runaway touchtone <laughs> telephone. <laughs> uh, it's an awfully short uh, span. You have to listen to more of it. One of the interesting things that we found connected with that is that um, if you listen to it for a longer period of time, you begin to hear two distinct um, voices. Um, there is a low drone beat, and there is a tinkling high melody. The, um, the interesting thing is that the letters that, and then we found out which letters are the low drone beat, what we found out is that the um, letters that compose the drone 
are the same letters that go up to making the two names of God, uh, Yahweh and Elohim. And uh, that's another coincidence. And it's very possible that it's indicating to us that the, um, the low drone is the carrier wave for the information and that the high tinkling melody is the information itself that we're trying to get at. I, uh, I always reserve the right, and it's my favorite time of the, of the whole program, to ask one extremely stupid question uh, during infinity. <laughs> and I just thought of my stupid question for this go-around. The, the question is that let's, let's do a complete flip-flop if we can. What you are doing and your motivations are extremely positive. They're upbeat. You're looking for codes and patterns in a religious text that would would uh, f- hopefully find a marriage between the scientific and and the spiritual. What if in all of this, it's a it's a satanic kind of quest rather than a high road? What if you're really on a low road? What if the you said the low tones spell out the two different names of God? What if it's some kind of a a uh, an evil game that somebody's playing with your minds and you're just pawns and in some sort of a negative structure, and what you're going to come up with might be destructive and negative as opposed to positive. Uh, For myself, with with my background in Aikido and, uh, and physics and spiritual disciplines, I tend to see the world much more in terms of a range of vibrational experience, just like the light that we see is a very small portion of the the electromagnetic spectrum, and we're awa- we're aware now of X-rays and TV and, and all that. Um, yet we don't call a 10 cycles per second bad and 30 good or anything like that. Um, I think what we're my sense is what we're looking at more is as just a possible expansion of our vibrational capacities. And just as when you send more energy through a very small electrical wire, um, it it, it, it t- tends to heat up. The, the wire needs to expand to be cleared out, to become a better channel in order to, to channel higher frequencies of vibration. And I see the, the process that I think that we are, uh, are touching into information about as being naturally self-selective, that a person only advances it as far as they can and in the process of altering their vibrational frequency upward in the scale, they actually need to clear out themselves as, as a channel. So it, it's evolution uh, taking care of itself. Um, I think we're wrapping up here, but very briefly, if I, by satanic you mean destructive, um, and that this text is somehow related to a destructive force, I think what we've got, if we take one step, if we take one step back, is we've got a society which is, uh, which really it, it's devoted to um, the scientific method. And science has created for us some very good things, but it's also created for us some very bad things. And we run the risk of blowing ourselves up and annihilating life on the planet. That, to me, is destructive. And one of the reasons that we're interested in, the, in this project is because it has a possibility for being one piece of the puzzle to help heal the mind-body split that exists in our culture. The mind has gone... Um, way beyond uh, our moral and heart capacity to handle that information. And perhaps there is information in the text of Genesis that will help um, us understand ourselves better and see ourselves as fourth dimensional beings, not just three dimensional beings. Thus we tackle one of the great fears that everyone has, and that is uh, what is death. And if we can really learn to see ourselves as fourth dimensional beings, it will have a tremendous impact on us psychically. And um, it's our hope that that our project will be one piece in a larger puzzle uh, that will enable mankind to take a step towards a higher consciousness and uh, creating a more lasting peace on the planet.